Hey guys, here I am again um, in my in my house. It's pretty cold out. Uh, so, and if you hear anything back back in the background, it's uh, my heater trying to work. And uh, living in a teacher's house, you know. And what I want to do is, I last left off at the end of the Civil War, um, and it's more about the military uh, finish and completion. And um, you had Lee surrendering to Grant. Uh, you had Johnston, uh, Joseph Johnston, Confederates surrendering to uh, uh, to Sherman, uh, William Sherman in the South, down in North Carolina to be exact. And finally, you had a guy you never really hear much about, him, named Richard Taylor. He was a fun, really fun Confederate to study and read about. He was uh, a direct relative of Zachary Taylor. He's the only uh, Confederate soldier. I think the only soldier, actually, uh, officer in the uh, Civil War that had a father that was a president, former president. So uh, you have Taylor surrendering uh, to uh, uh, Canby uh, down in Alabama. And that one is a fun one to read about if you ever get a chance. Um, Taylor and Canby both had some really good personalities to them. In fact, when they surrendered, um, they had a big banquet and they sat there and ate well and toasted each other and Canby uh the band played Hail Columbia, which is a, which is really a, 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 a very patriotic American song. And um, Canby then said, wait, wait, play Dixie for my, my friend here, uh, Taylor. And then Taylor, you know, being the gentleman set, shot right back, said, no, can, you know, go back to Hail Columbia. And why that matters, a story is, this is a sense of unity. It's over. And it ended in a strange fashion, I tell you, last time, because you have these commanding officers, you have this, this, incredibly ferocious vicious war and it just ends in a very odd way ended in an odd way and um they now must move from being good soldiers to good citizens and i think this is the idea of that transition and i think today you know with our election coming up 2020 everyone's concerned of what's going to happen and i think that's the lesson of the american civil war um lincoln Probably the one thing to read is Lincoln's second inaugural address. I mentioned this also previously that most people don't read. It's not very long, very short. And um, Lincoln's very last line in that speech is important. But in the speech, he also said uh, to the effect that um, both he talks about the Americans. He never says really North or South specifically, but he says both read the same Bible and both prayed to the same God. And he went on. So he's trying to say, look, we, we really have these these things in common, he was saying, that make us who we are as Americans, and, and including the Gettysburg Address. And I'll get to that in a minute. But at the end of the second uh, inaugural, the most famous lines is he said, with malice toward none, with hatred toward none, charity for all. Uh, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds. To care for him who, sh who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan. Now in that line, that one little line right there, nothing about north-south. This is for all, but including, you got to remember where we last left off also with some battles. Yes, black soldiers. Lincoln's alluding to this idea. Lincoln, the thing about Lincoln is everybody wants to make him into something that he ended up becoming. And the thing about Lincoln in one uh, I can't remember her name, but she wrote, she was an abolitionist in the North, and she wrote this wonderful statement about Abraham Lincoln about two days before he was assassinated. And she said, well, I have to thank God for Lincoln now because I watched him grow as a president. And, and that's, the, that's the case. He grew into the presidency. He grew into what was going on. He, Lincoln reacted to the events and then decided what to do. And why I'm saying all this is set up um, just like anything else is that's how you have to deal with this thing called now reconstruction. You have to reconstruct. And that's a weird term. We're going to reconstruct the nation. And, and I've read all kinds of different definitions and textbooks and everything else. And it's really a, an elusive topic. And the Lincoln is basically about getting back to the business of the day, just like he would say in his second inaugural. You know, and, and, and foreshadowing this and to prove that Lincoln kind of has a consistency to him, if you find out. But Lincoln has a growth factor which is amazing. Uh, th this is, to me, is wonderful statesmanship and what made him so good. Um, you go back and look at Lincoln's Gettysburg Address in 1863, November 19th, 1863, where he gave this address at Gettysburg Cemetery. And this is this 
one little line in there, he said, this new birth of freedom. This is it. If somebody said, hey, Reconstruction, what is it, Gallagher? I'd say, it's a new birth of freedom. Lincoln said it. Why should, why should I, uh, you know, to steal a line from Lincoln and his Gettysburg Address, how can I nobly add or detract? How can my poor words say any more than what these guys have done? And Lincoln is now saying we have to get on with the business. And it's really, to me, emancipation as an unfinished job. It's the unfinished revolution. And this is what Lincoln really was saying. And, and he's a genius in this. And I'm going to be honest with you. Um, because if you really get into Reconstruction and start reading, if you saw the film by Steven Spielberg or Lincoln, it's a pretty darn good one. He's got a lot right in there. And um, when you when you when you go through this, it ultimately is the question of what are the status of blacks? Because think about it. Slavery. Now you had free blacks, you know, blacks are served in the army. And that's that's something Lincoln's alluding to when you when you think of this. Those who were born in the battle. What about these guys? What about those who fought at Fort Wagner and paid with their lives dearly? And that's why I showed you that letter that Hannah Johnson wrote. It it, it gets the sense, how are we going to make this work? Lincoln, no question, believed in colonization. First thing true about Lincoln, he hated slavery. He said, if, if slavery isn't wrong, nothing's wrong. You know, I mean, I mean, slavery is just the worst thing. Lincoln, that one line I told you, you know, when someone <laughs> tried to tell Lincoln about slavery, he said, I never knew anybody who was anxious to have it tried on themselves. <laughs> okay. And so Lincoln is not this guy who's saying, okay, blacks are white people. He's not saying that. He's not saying that uh, it's all going to end, everyone's going to be fine. He is talking about it and originally colonization. You know, you, the, the races must be separate. But what you miss if you stop there, first of all, if you stop there, you're stopping in the middle of the dang movie. But what you got to get is he grew. And Lincoln realized the new birth of freedom, and this idea of reconstruction, as he said in the second inaugural, either he's lying or he's not. I mean, what is it? And Lincoln's a liar. I'd love to hear this. So the reality is, you know, honest day, right? No, Lincoln's consistent. And he's saying, OK, he's saying, here's where we are right now. But these soldiers who fought, these soldiers who sacrificed, how can you deny? And that's the key word. How can you deny the rights? These rights, the Declaration of Independence, never off that drumbeat. And so this is all men are created equal. So Link is coming right back to it. Now, the problem with this is that's the theoretical sense, the practical sense he had to deal with his party. <laughs> And I told you this in another video before, too. And it's nothing different. OK, Lincoln has to deal with conservative Republicans who are saying, oh, no, this can't be true. We can't have, you know, you know what they're not. They're not, they don't even really they're not even sure they want the end of slavery. The 13th Amendment, for heaven's sake, that is now going to be this idea of you have to get rid of slavery. Even the conservative Republicans out of the north are saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. That when you when you watch Steven Spielberg's movie Lincoln. That's exactly right. You had to get the votes. What amazes me is in 1863, they could have had the 13th Amendment already done. It fell short by, guess how many votes? 13 votes. Uh, all Democrats voted against it uh, and enough conservative Republicans. And that's why when you watch the film, finally you get the 13th Amendment through. Is the third time, third time strong, the 13th Amendment voted on by the time you get 1865. And you had just enough votes to squeak through. You had enough to abstain, which is true. And then you had enough they got through. And the 13th Amendment was the idea of ending slavery. It's the most amazing document to really read and sit and contemplate because it's the first time the word slave or slavery would be put into the Constitution. Prior to that, it's not there. It's going to be put in. Plus, the other thing about 13th Amendment, it turned everything on its head. And what I meant by that as far as political rights and power went. The idea of the American government that was developed was the idea of, think of this in a context, in the American Revolution, what did the American founding fathers fear the most? They feared government. Think about it. They feared the tyrannical overreach of government. So everything was meant to protect the states, protect the states. 13th Amendment is the first time you reverse that. You reverse it now with the federal government now going to use its power to command, to dictate, uh, to argue. It's going to throw its force behind a law that says you cannot have someone the word slavery in involuntary servitude. Read it carefully. It's an amazing, short, but powerful, boom, document. 
like me, short but powerful. But here we go. All right. So uh, the 13th Amendment, you know, what happens is this is going on. Lincoln's party, the conservative Republicans say, we don't want it. The radical Republicans said, you can't go. You want anyone go go further, go further. Give, give blacks, you know, everything. You give, give them the same equal rights, let them vote. You know, Lincoln is sitting there in the middle and saying, I'm not willing to go this far. And one of the key people in Lincoln's cabinet wrote him and said, Mr. Lincoln, you know, I hope that you stand firm. And Lincoln's response is a classic Lincoln response. He said, um, I'm standing firm, but not I'm hoping I'm standing firm enough that I don't get knocked backward. But I'm hope, hopefully standing firm enough that not I don't move too fast forward. It's it's classic Lincoln. Meaning I don't want to go backward because these conservative Republicans saying we can't, you know, we can't, we gotta, you know, we don't want this to happen. But the radical Republicans, it's too fast, it's too much, it's too soon. There is a wonderful thing about timing, and Lincoln was a time master of timing. And that's the other thing. When people try to evaluate him, you have to look at that one thing, and that's what made him an adept politician. Okay? And uh, so I think that's it. He had this genius. That's when I say genius. That's what I mean. It doesn't mean he's sitting there and he's like Einstein, his IQ is off the charts. It has to do with his ability to understand the timing and the atmosphere. And, and, and he could get a good uh, barometric reading sort of in a political manner towards this. So, but it opened up a major question, a major question, because Congress obviously had other designs, because the Congress is made up of these different groups, uh, Northern Democrats, conservative Republicans, radical Republicans, and moderate Republicans too, which is Lincoln was a moderate. It let it open up a question of who was going to control the reconstruction of the states that had uh, in the South. How do you, how do you, what do you, what, what are the statuses of the blacks and what are the status of the states in the South? Did they secede? Lincoln said they never seceded. This is theoretical. Uh, some of the more radical Republicans like Charles Sumner and them said, oh, yeah, you know, they committed treason. This is horrible. You know, we need to we need to handle them as such. You know, that goes against. Obviously, you did Lincoln agree with them now because I just read it with malice toward none. You know, <laughs> charity for all. Here we go. Lincoln is trying to say, let's get on with the business of the day. Lincoln's plan is going to become known as the 10 percent plan. And in the 10 percent plan, that's not what Lincoln initially called it. He said when 10 percent of the eligible voters from the 1860 election, election that he won take an oath of loyalty to the union, that state can be reconstructed, can get back in. 10%. So you can take the state of Florida, you can have 4,000 people take this oath, woohoo, and Florida can send senators to DC. <laughs> the L of Lincoln makes sense. Not loser, okay? L for Lincoln, L for leniency to be lenient, and also to be loyal. Be loyal to what? Be loyal to the union. And, and this is the concept, and the ends, ends it. Now, uh, when you look at this, you know, where everybody's going to be uh, loyal. Now, uh, one of my favorite quotes, and I got to say her name carefully, is Susan Emmeline Jeffords Caldwell. This is one person uh, who said, quote, I want peace, but I don't want to go back into the union. OK, this is, <laughs> this is a female in Virginia. Um, you have some harsh feelings about this. This is the difficult part of, here's the other word, litig uh, uh, legislation. You can't, uh, I don't it's very difficult to legislate people's feelings. And I think you learn this in a lot of ways, but I think there is a sense that we respect the law. And that's, to me, an essence of the Civil War, just like Lincoln. You may not like the way it is now, but you have a choice. And the power, the choice is a power. Voting is a power. It's a choice. And when you look at it, I mean, democracy to me is two things, voice and choice. You have the right to represent and say, but you have the right to choose and the powers in the people in a sense. And that's what the Civil War is about. The power must ultimately be in the people. But the people must ultimately then support the government, which means the law. It has nothing to do with whether I like this guy, hate that guy. The reality comes down to the law. And is the law the benefit for all? And, and so this became the sense. And the, and the Civil War really is the contest of that. So besides her commentary, uh, it, it represents a segment of the population, but we're all Southerners feeling this way. No, and I have quite a bit to get into Reconstruction. I'm not really going to get into the meat and gravy Reconstruction. Wait till you guys come back, and then we're really going to get into it. But there's three questions behind all this. The, the big question is who controlled Reconstruction? Three possibilities. Either it's the president, either it's Congress, or it could be the states. Now, you got to get this. Even when Lincoln's going to uh, promote the 13th Amendment, which is fine, uh, after Lincoln is assassinated in April 15th of 1865, now Reconstruction fell into Congress's laps, basically. And when Congress is going to pass uh, the 14th and 15th Amendment, the 15th Amendment was about voting rights. 
13th Amendment ended slavery. Blacks are no longer slaves. 14th Amendment, citizenship. Blacks now have all the same equal rights. You're born in the country, you have those rights. The third is the 15th Amendment. These are the three amendments passed during Reconstruction by the Republican Congress. It's a revolution. The 15th Amendment, though, African Americans right to vote. If you get, take a careful analysis of this, you had states in the North that said, we're not going to let them do that. So it's not just a Southern thing. So the question is, who controlled Reconstruction? And why this matters so much is we are still dealing with Reconstruction. That's what the Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s, 1960s. This is why Martin Luther King Jr. is up there giving these speeches. You know, if everything was just wonderfully taken care of the 1860s after the Civil War, you know, what, what in the world is Martin Luther King Jr. doing? You know, think about it. He's making this speech about, I have a dream. That's the dream. The dream was what was supposed to happen in 1865, 66, 67, 1870. Nope. We're still, we're still chasing the dream. Okay. And, and this became the real question. Those things of what's the status of blacks? You know, who controls the reconstruction process? Who, who, who legislates? This idea of equality. Okay. By the way, when we get to the word equality, Equality by itself means what? Am I equal to you? No, I told you. You got to define it. Political equality, social equality, you know, economic equality. Okay, these are the, the, the elements that define that. Economic equality, you know, when you think of that, you know, Karl Marx is talking about these things. But even back in the 1860s, uh, the Republican Congress was talking about what you have to have is, is access to education, access to these things. This is the idea. This is the American concept. The right to till your own field by the sweat of your brow. Because there had been experiments already with gradual emancipation in the North. You should know this. And there was some of that gradual emancipation in the North ended up with these things called apprenticeships, where there wasn't this movement from uh, absolute uh, into absolute freedom. Because if you don't have if you don't have an economic basis, think about it, you're teenagers, right? If you don't have the money, then how do you get the freedom? I mean, my dad, you know, my roof, my rules. Uh, all right. So how do you get out from under that roof? You have to have the economic freedom. But that meant the right to work the land of your own and not under someone else. That's the same thing Lincoln was saying. The Republican Party was saying in the 1840s, 1850s. By the sweat of my brow, I work, I earn, it's mine. That inherently is the idea of the American dream, along with the political equality. Political equality means my vote's same as yours. But if I'm living in an old plantation system, how do I vote freely if this guy that's the planter controls me? No difference if I'm in a factory. Don't vote the way I want. Well, I can get you. There is a sense that there has to be a respect, ultimately. So you can't legislate everything. There has to be this sense of equality means you and I sitting on a porch together, drinking a glass of tea together and and talking. And we're not going to bludgeon each other over you know, some differences. And that's exactly what Lee Grant, Jonathan Sherman, and Taylor and, and Canby taught us. These were soldiers for heaven. They're good soldiers, good citizens. And I think that's the essence of it. Um, you know, and, and to summarize, you know, the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments are the amendments I want you to understand. Three amendments passed in a very short brief of time, within five years. And these three amendments are the most important ones I think you can read in the Constitution. Because they're not the, the rights of just blacks. We apply it this way because of the history. It, it, it's all. King Jr. even said it. You know, injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere. Injustice to some is an injustice to all. Remember the story of Nazi Germany. You can sit and watch these different groups you know, be denied. Yeah. Pretty soon, who's next? So it is. it has to be all as Jefferson said and Lincoln said, it must be all, must mean none left out. But Walt Whitman had a great line. He was a very observant person of the Civil War. He said, it is strange that battle, martyrs, blood, and even assassination, because it's after Lincoln, can condense a nationality. It is times of crisis that we have to react. And it is times of crisis that the United States has reacted properly. The United States has acted properly in 1941 for Harvard. The United States acted properly in the Great Depression where people pulled together. My dad was a Great Depression kid. He said, either you're going to pull apart. He says, families in Depression, either you're pulling apart or you're pulling together and you find out pretty quick. What are you in for? You're in for the family. You're going to take care of each other. 
Uh, you know, we, we, the whole United States in a crisis situation has been about. It's not about me. It's about more. And that's what, for heaven's sake, the posterity. That's exactly when you look at the American Revolution. That's exactly what they said. It is not for me. It is for the unborn. Civil War, same thing. Lincoln, these men did not die in vain. So when you look at history, you know, I mean, it's facts. It, it, it's these concepts. But what does it really mean? There must be a meaning, a purpose, an understanding. Study, read. That's why you have a textbook. Textbook standardized. I read the same thing you do. Then we can discuss what's a deeper understanding of this. Does it apply to what we're seeing going on today? History's in us. It's not just something to be read. You have to read first. Because if you don't read, how do you get your history? Just from this wacko on the screen right here. Yeah, that's a good answer. It's a bad answer. Okay. So I miss you guys. We're getting close to coming back. I can't wait. Uh, I, I appreciate you watching the videos. I appreciate any feedback. And I'm glad that you're allowing me to come into your, your homes and your uh, makeshift domiciles there on campus. Okay. <laughs> Nothing like a cadet's life. You know, write that book, The Cadet's Life. Okay. I miss you guys. Say that a lot, but I really do. And uh, stay warm. Bye-bye.